Hey everyone, welcome back to our series on Excel for Data Science. Today we're going to cover one-way ANOVAs. What the heck is a one-way ANOVA? So we've been covering t-tests, we've gone through the three different types of t-tests, but if you have more than two groups, you need to move into ANOVA. And what ANOVA does is it allows you to test more than two groups at a time against each other. So now we're going to compare three groups. We could do 15. You might regret it, but you could do 15. So a one-way ANOVA means I have one independent variable that's grouped. So I've got low, average, and high here. And then um, each person has a score on that variable. Between subjects, meaning that everyone is in a different group. So my low, average, and high group are different groups of people, which are represented by creating tidy data here, um, where each person gets their own row. However, the problem with using the ANOVA function in the data analysis package is that it does not support tidy data in any form. So we're going to have to transform this into not tidy data, which sucks if you're wanting to stick to tidy data principles, but it's good to know when you can and can't use it in Excel. Okay. To do that, I'm just going to do some filtering. There are probably better ways to do this, and if you have some, you can fill them in in the comments below, and I'll add that to the next video. But let's say you have thousands and thousands of data points and um, you need to untidy them. So I, what I would do is click data, then click filter. Um, I click my little down arrow here and just pick whichever group I want to start with first. So we're going to start with our low group. We're going to cut and paste those into a new sheet in which we're going to stick low here. Blow this up a little bit go back, repeat that process for all the groups. So filtering makes this a little easier because you can see just the data points you're interested in. And this is average and high. It's kind of a quick way to convert from tidy data to not tidy data. And the biggest problem I have with this, just high please, um, layout is that as you, let's say you move on to Python or R or SPSS, um, this layout implies that there's one person who's been in all three groups. Uh, this layout makes it very clear that that is not true. So if you're adhering to tidy data principles, which um, are in our first video, I would know that there's three different totally groups, different groups of people. So I would know that a between subjects ANOVA wasn't um, correct. However, if I got data like this from a person, I would now assume that this is three um, levels all tested on the same people. So that's one kind of issue with Excel here. But it was easy to convert. To run the ANOVA, you're still in the Data tab. Click Data Analysis. It's the very first one at the top, ANOVA Single Factor. And then they don't really have an option for with replication. So if you have... Um, and ANOVA that you need is uh, repeated measures, there's not really a good option here um, in the data analysis tool pack to deal with that. So let's click OK. What I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight the cells and I can actually highlight the group names too, that'll be helpful. They are grouped by columns and there are labels in the first row and I'm going to stick alpha as 0.05. Put that in a new worksheet let's see what we got here. So the first thing that happens is it gives me how many people are in each group. This is n. This is the sum, which I don't need. The means for each group. And then this is variance. Remember that to get standard deviation for each group, what you could do is equals sqrt, open parentheses, highlight the number, close parentheses, and then it'll tell me the variance or the standard deviation for each group. To get all three of them, I could come over here, wait for this to change from white to black, double click, and now I have all three of the standard deviations, which will be very useful for graphs. Come down here and it gives me some information about my ANOVA. This is sum of squares. Now I'm not going to explain what all these terms are, but I have some really great videos on like what are all of these and how are all these calculated for my undergraduate statistics course, if you're interested in that. Instead, I would just want to tell you if you kind of already know what ANOVAs are and you're trying to write this up, you would do F, open parentheses, degrees of freedom one here, 
So I'd put in two, comma, 27 for degrees of freedom two, equals, type that F number, so 25.99, if I round up, P is less than 0 0.001. I'm not good with scientific notation, but pretty sure that's right. And then that's all we got. So you could convert this number from scientific notation, click on home, and then number. And usually, there we go. Now, I, I okay, that's only two zeros. If you wanted three, you could click here. Oop, wrong one. So you get more. So now I kind of know that less than 0 0.001 is correct. Now, if you've been watching my other videos, you know that I usually tell people to include a measure of effect size because p-values are not the most useful things. How would we do that here? So we could calculate r squared or eta squared. Okay, these are the exact same number. Most people report eta squared with ANOVA because we just like curly ends. I don't know, they're calculated in the exact same way. So either one. What you would do is do, uh, the formula is sum of squares between divided by sum of squares between plus sum of squares within, or we, we actually have the total here, so we can use sum of squares total. Okay. Now the total score is, is um, between plus within. Okay. So we could do equals, sum of squares between, hit the divide symbol, sum of squares total, hit enter, and we've got a really big r squared here. So uh, R squared equals 0.66. Okay. And so I could say that there is a, um, a large effect of the differences between these groups. And then I could come over here and look at the means and talk about the low group is probably the lowest and the high group is probably the highest. But the biggest issue with ANOVA is it doesn't actually answer that question. So ANOVA tells me that there's some difference somewhere between these three means, but it doesn't tell me where. Okay. And so that gets us into post hoc tests. So post hoc tests are when you test groups against each other to figure out where that difference lies. So we have multiple combinations. We could do low versus uh, average. We could do low versus high. We could do average versus high. You could go nuts and do low versus the average of average and high, you could do low average of low and average together versus high. There's a bunch of bunch bunch of combinations here. Okay, um, here let's just do this so it's all the same way. Um, you could do low and high average together against average and average and like, like it's all the combinations. Generally what people do is this, okay? These are called pairwise post hoc tests. Um, and what that means is like each pair one at a time, okay? So the nice thing is that we can do these with independent T, so apply the principles we learned last week. The bad thing is that you can't fix the fact that you're running a bunch of tests. So um, anytime you start running a lot of tests, uh, you increase your chance of finding something, quote, significant, unquote, um, just because you're running a bunch of tests. So it's kind of like the lottery. In theory, your chances are better the more tickets you buy. So the more statistical tests you run, your chances are better of finding one thing being important. Okay. Um, but if we just wanted the math on these, we could apply last week's video so we would go to data, data analysis, and you will have to click through and do these one at a time, unfortunately. So we do P T test, paired sample, assuming equal variances. Um, and probably because our variances are pretty even if you look at them. Oops. Um, well, I, made, I, made, I messed that up, but we can check real quick, make sure our variances are equal so we can assume that. Try that again. Two samples assuming equal variances. Now I can highlight variable one, click, highlight variable two. Okay, my hypothesized mean difference is zero. There are labels, click OK. And now I have what happened between low and average. 
I would repeat that twice more. I would do low versus high and then average versus high. I won't bore you to death with it, but you would repeat that process. And now, now you're thinking, why would I even run the ANOVA when I could just do the three pairwise tests? I know, I tell my students this all the time. This seems obvious. What happens is you run the ANOVA to determine if you should run those t-tests. So ANOVA is kind of like the gateway. Is there an effect at all? If there's not, you go and you take a nap and you're sad that your experiment doesn't work. If there is, then you look for where. So it's kind of like a police report. Um, police report to, and they investigate to see if anything happened at all. If something did happen, they try to figure out what happened. So that's kind of how I think about ANOVA. If we wanted to report this, we could say T, we plop in our degrees of freedom here, so 18. Put in our t stat value, that's this one right here, so negative 4.14. Say p equals, well, it's less than 0.001. Okay. And then we'd probably want to calculate our Cohen's d effect size. Right. We talked about that bad boy last week. So remember that's mean 1 minus mean 2 divided by <clears throat> um, pooled standard error, standard deviation pooled. So what we do is do equals, open parentheses, mean one minus mean two, close parentheses, divided by SQRT, because this is variance and not standard deviation. And we want the pooled variance right here. Close, equals, and we get a pretty big effect size. So I go back and fill that in. So the difference between one, low and high average is Oh, if I can type a large effect. Okay. And so we'd run that twice more. We go low to um, average, low to high, and average to high. We wanted all pairwise combinations. And so if I did that, what would I do to fix my problem? So here, it's called fishing where you run a bunch of tests. Okay, and so this is a type one error correction. Okay. And specifically, the easiest one to explain and to carry out is Bonferroni. Um, that might be one R and two Ns. Uh, I can never remember. So one of those is correct. Let's just say it has 800 Ns and four Rs because I can't ever spell it right. Okay. So the Bonferroni correction. Well, how does that work? Well, what you do is you take your alpha and it asked you for alpha when you were clicking on the test. So you could say 0.05. You divide that alpha by the number of comparisons. Okay. And in that case, this is three. Um, low to average, low to high, average to high. Okay. So our new alpha would be 0.05. One six repeating. Because okay. if we did 0.05 divided by three, it's 0.016 repeating. Okay. So two ways that you can handle that. When you're running your post hoc tests, okay, so before we did this, what we could have done is this. Okay, data analysis, two sample assuming equal variances. I'm gonna leave this alone. This is the exact same one we ran. Now we've got a new alpha, so we do put it in there. Click OK, and it will correct our test for us. But it still tells us the real p-value. So none of these numbers have changed. This is the same set of numbers from before. So 0 0.003, blah, blah, blah. oh wait, it did change. Nope, didn't change, sorry, I got excited. So I put the wrong p-value on this one, I'm sorry. This should be p less than 0 0.001 because it's two-tailed. I should have been looking here. Okay. So be sure you look at the two-tailed test. But here is what changed. So the critical value for the two-tailed test is 2.10. If you look over here, that critical value is now 2.63. So what it's done is it hasn't corrected the t, the p-value. So things like R, um, SPSS, JASP, your sort of statistical programs, I'm familiar with those, they will correct p-values for you. Excel, what it does is it tells you a corrected cutoff score. Okay. 
So I know that my test is still significant, right? Because my t-stat is greater than the cutoff score, but absolute value. But it doesn't actually fix my p-value for me. So what I always do in this scenario when I don't have, maybe don't have the software to correct, is I just talk about um, new alpha equals 0.0167, report the real p-values, and interpret based on new alpha. Okay. So whatever the real p-value is, 0.0006 thing, whatever, is that less than 0.0167? Yes, so I could give it that significant label. Okay. Another real good thing is to just imp uh, interpret the effect sizes as practical significance and don't care about those p-values anyway. Okay. Now I know that that's not totally something people can do because of um, sort of systematic re uh, um, people like it the way they like it. They like P less than 0.05, but adding that effect size really helps uh, bolster your arguments. Last but not least, let's talk about graphs. So we have our averages here for each group. So we're gonna copy those. So I'm gonna highlight and oh, I'm gonna try. Uh, I'm gonna try to highlight the, the right cells here, calculating average and my standard deviation. Gonna stick this on a new sheet. I'm gonna have 87 sheets by the time we're done. But these are our means. I'm gonna take this, and so I'm not tempted, I'm gonna move it over here. And these are our SDs. And the reason I suggest um, sitting them in separate places is that you don't um, want to try to graph both of them on the same graph. Remember, we're only using the SDs to help us uh, create error bars that we um, that are appropriate for the data. We can graph this just like t-test last week, so let's click insert. Um, I'm going to highlight all of my data here. Click on the little 2D column button. Click the first one. Uh, first thing I'm going to do is kind of clean this up. So I'm going to delete the word means. I would add chart element axes titles, horizontal, titles, vertical. And I could say, um, let's say it's low, average, and high uh, number of snow days. Although I'm filming this in the middle of the summer, but. Okay. And let's say uh, feelings here from the teachers in May. So how anxious are the students and the teachers? So anxiety in May of teachers. Okay. So maybe if we had a lot of snow days, the teachers are really anxious because they've had to stay extra days to work more. <laughs> Making this up on the fly here. So we could also cut off zero because our scale only ran from let, let's say one to 10. So if I double click on the axis, I'll get double click on the axis. I'll get axis options. Okay, And I can um, usually, there it goes, format axis, it finally popped up. You could say, okay, this actually runs from one to nine. Didn't like that. So I could chop off that bottom because that bottom is not actually there. Then I can click on my three bars and do add chart element, error bars, more options. Because remember, you want control here. Come down to custom. Don't let Excel pick those numbers for you. You don't want to do that. Specify value, highlight your standard deviations, click here to get the negative half so that they're all the same on the top and the bottom because error bars are usually even on each side. Click OK. And then I could change the color of the plot too. If I can't do color options, I could maybe make that uh, no fill. 
Okay, oh, that looks crazy. Let's do solid fill and pick a nice light gray so we can still see our error bars. Okay. Now remember, when you're doing the error bar options, you always wanna pick the custom options because then you're showing what the actual standard deviation of your data is and not Excel's calculated random number. So if you tell Excel to do the standard deviation, it does the standard deviation of the means, the three means, not the standard deviation of the data, which is not the same thing. Okay. And you would just wanna say that these error bars represent one standard deviation of the data. So all that together is kind of a, a way to do ANOVAs, some post hoc tests, um, which doesn't support tidy data, allows you to fix those, calculate effect sizes, and then finally, um, although it ran off the thing here, how to do graphs for ANOVA.